Chem Carson is back with us from Kai Volatility Advisors, Senior Managing Partner. Chem, welcome back. Good to be back. Summer's over. All right, back in the seat. Summer trade is over. Technically, this is like the seasonality worst time of the year. Are we just going to throw all that out the window and ramp this puppy up or what? People love to look uh, first of the month to the end of the month. Uh, and actually, the seasonality is much less tied to a calendar month, and it's much more tied to the expiration cycles. Okay, yeah. Uh, I was going to say, you think in terms of options calendar. It's so important to understand this. It's the primary driver of the seasonality across the board. There's other effects that are part of it as well, but that's critical to the actual forces that drive the seasonality. Um, we are through expiration. Yeah. Right. And actually, for all practical purposes, uh, two weeks ago, we put the kind of all clear sign. Uh, once those Vaughn and Charm flows start kicking in and you haven't had the volatility in that window, the downside that you needed, um, it's all systems go. And that's what we were very clear about that. And sure enough, this last two weeks has been an incredible run. Um, what kind of potential do you think it's got here as we're like putting in highs and charts that struggle for a long time? This feels a lot like when uh, the Fed uh, last December kind of surprise markets, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I think said we're done. A, yeah, said we're not only we're done, we're, they were going to cut five times, right, this year. And remember, everything got priced in right away. What did markets do for the next three months? Took off like a rocket mm -hmm. ship, right? Um, and, and so that's a big part of it. There's other things that are really, uh, you know, very important for markets other than the interest rate piece. That's great for the economy. Okay. For the markets, there's a seasonality effect, which we've talked about uh, in years past. But I think it's critical to keep in mind when the market is up 20 percent for the year, you've had, uh, by, by some calculations, $50 trillion of buyback in that year, a re-leveraging effect. And, and some portion of that, about 10 percent, you know, we can wave our hands at it, comes January 1st. Of next year, you know, this is an, uh, you know, that's five trillion dollars in a world where a hundred billion dollars to 150 billion dollars is what the incremental change and in moves in markets today. Uh, the incremental amount that's pushing this market up two percent today is probably about 150 to 200 billion dollars. Mm. It's nothing. It's nothing. You know, a two percent move in the market is is like adding a, a trillion dollars. Right. Mm. So it's a, this is a, a, a leverage, uh, you know, low, low cap um, uh, venture capital deal. Essentially, <laughs> but, you know, that, that's what the market is at, at, at baseline. And people don't really realize that. So that effect is so important. Uh, and then you have incredibly slow time uh, in markets in terms of 60 uh, percent volume weighted time during the last two months of the year from mid-November to mid-January, actually. Mm. That's, the action is very important. There. That's important. And then last of all, you have the biggest expirations uh, of the year in December, always December and January. That has a massive amount of skew in it, much okay. more than it usually has. Significant amount of vol. That creates massive, that's that wall of worry people talk about. That's the actual supply and demand that drives that flow. So you're sh cutting time down on a massive amount of skew and volatility in the market that needs to force these Vaughn and Charm flows right as you have massive buyback January 1st in the market on the re-leveraging effect. You know, the last two months of the year, uh, you'd be insane to try and short this market in that window, in my opinion. Mm. Um, you have a, a month here uh, where, in theory, things could get a little weird. With um, election? Until, until you get to the election. The election of event vol itself is so big. That's another I wonder if that's buyback. also kind of been priced in to some degree. How do you know if the election stuff, because there's a little kink in vol around there, right? Like, is Yeah, it so we do an event vol. It's about $115 straddle for that day okay. currently. Um, it's been trending higher for some time, and, and uh, yes, compared to everything else, it looks like a kink. But that, right. that's not a kink. It's an event, and there's, it's a separate important event. And it's probably getting dragged, too, right now as general vol drops. Is it? Is, is it? No, it's not, actually. Really? It's okay. up today while everything else is down. Interesting. Which is an okay. opportunity and a trade I, I actually recommend the more sophisticated people to look at. But, but it, important to note that uh, you know, $115 sounds like a lot for your average daily move. But that's 2%. That's what we're up today. Right. And we're talking about a contested election with dramatically different outcomes uh, in some ways for different candidates. So you can argue that's still very cheap. Really? Uh, and, and absolutely. Wow. And, and uh, especially compared to, let's say, a December behind it, um, there's all kinds of things that you can do out mm. there to, to capture that ball, which is a particularly interesting trade. Is it such that if you want to put on like some kind of a hedge before the end of the year that it's best to do it around that event that has catalytic potential in November if you Absolutely. think the catalytic potential is that high? Yeah, it looks high to your average person. If you don't know what you're doing, you're going to go sell that, you're going to buy things around it. Uh. But uh, the number one thing to understand is that event is is the, the thing that's going to drive uh, the end of 
year uh, 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 up move in the markets um, or volatility broadly, uh, up or down. And uh, if you're not exposed to that, uh, you're in big trouble between now and then. Not to get two kind of uh, ideas bouncing off each other, if then hypotheticals and stuff, but does a breakout in stocks, does a possible uplift in the economy remove potential vol from that election if it makes the decision easier? If people go, you know what, the economy's actually doing well, we just caught 50. Does that skew the possibility in one way or the other? They're all part of the equation, 100%. You already have mechanical flows that are very positive as long as this market doesn't fall 15% from here between now and November. You already have an accelerated time, all this Vonnachar buyback and all the things that I've, I've talked about in terms of the flows uh, out there. Now the Fed has put in 50 basis points and has managed mm. to, to hold down the curve, which is going to support the economy. What did we see when they did this in December? It looked like things were falling apart. We were going to recession. The next three months, completely different uh, turnout. That's because the Fed policy at this juncture is incredibly inelastic. What do I mean by that? The amount, if, you, if they raise rates, it doesn't affect the economy that much because particularly in real estate, people are just not going to go buy more, right? Okay. They're, but they're already locked in at low rates. It's not costing them more. But if they can manage to bring rates down a, a bit, which they've done, now the real estate market, all this sequestered demand that's been sitting there flows into the market, right? So they have this ace in the hole, which is demand, and, and, and this is a demand push economy. Um, and, and, and millennials in particular are looking to get into homes. Mm. And, and if they, whenever they spur that demand, all of a sudden you get surprises to the upside in terms of every single number across the board. Um, so I would expect the same to happen in this period. The wealth effect, if, if I'm right and this market goes higher here, will continue to also kick in. And they get in that flywheel where all of a sudden, you know, this demand push economy, things are hot again. Okay, so this and that brings in the steepener, right? Exactly. You know exactly where I'm going, which is that's the one part of your thesis from this year that you're looking for it to come back into because you're looking for like 5% plus. This is exactly what we called for, by the way, three months ago. Not not the end of the year number, but the, the action here. We've been saying for, for two, three months the Fed's going to be more aggressive than people think. They're yeah. going to lower the front end of the curve. The part that we haven't that hasn't happened yet, which we still believe is coming, look for it. This is your moment is for as that happens, inflation to start kicking back up. And if that happens, which is what I see coming, coming down the, the pipe, the steepener couldn't, is the perfect trade, right? Okay. Because, because the front end is being held down by the Fed who's stimulating, and now the back starts taking off. We have not seen that in 20 years. That is like that, the reason the market is initial you know, uh, impulse is to lower the whole curve is because that's what's worked for 20, 30 years. If the the right. Fed starts lowering, it's like, well, the, we're going into recession, and this yeah. whole thing's falling apart. This is becoming of this time is different argument. This is different yeah. than well, the last 40 years. It is not different than the last time we saw secular inflation, deglobalization, populism. It's the mm. same damn thing that we saw then. You're just looking at the wrong data set. Uh, the yield curve on inversion, the steepener that we were getting, that bull steepener, to your point, is that kind of classic, like, oh, the words coming out across the curve, Fed's got to cut because we're in trouble. Then the last three days here, since the low in the two-year, you got the bear steepener coming in, which is to your more your point, which is about the growth potential kind of getting priced up now. Yep. What do you look for then to see if that actually does have the ability to turn yields back higher? Is it commodities or what do you look well, for? Well, in terms of price, right, the curve, the way the trades work, people look at like interest rates. But if the front comes down, there's it's too easy to just buy the calendar. So people to lock in trades have to sell the back a little bit, right, to, to lock in profit. So it's natural for this to happen at first, but, but, but the numbers that they start coming in will lift that back, and the Fed is holding down the front. They've been clear now. I think they'll likely not be able to cut as much as you think, mm -hmm. right? But they'll still be able to hold down that front number while the back uh, goes higher. So I, I would just be watching uh, as we get out into, uh, if we do continue to, to rally, which I believe we will in the next several months, um, I would be watching uh, those inflation numbers okay. right? uh, very closely. I, I think they will come out hotter uh, than people expect uh, in a structural way. Uh, I would be watching tips. I would be watching break-evens. Uh, I think that's the core driver of this move. It's not just the yield curve. It's the actual structural uh, uh, inflation that lies under the, under the hood. Okay. Um, I would be watching policy at its core, right? Uh, that's important. We're going into right. an election. Policy matters. And right. there's a couple really big things sitting out there in the election that very few people are talking about. Real quick, hit me what you think is the big one. The biggest market is the moving biggest one. by far. The, the, the core reason labor inflation hasn't been worse than it is is because of an open immigration policy here in the United okay, States. Okay, fair enough. It's incredibly unpopular, right. but that's what's driving holding down inflation. 
And the second you close those walls and you close out inflation, labor inflation will go through the roof mm. if this economy reaccelerates. It is something that people have been looking for for a while that hasn't kicked in. So it's an explanation for uh, how to fill that gap, basically, and a lot of folks' kind of expectations for the way things were going to happen with labor. All right, good stuff. So we're in pretty good shape for stocks. If you're more thinking about inflation coming back, then you're not worried about big recessionary stuff hitting us anytime soon. No, I really actually think it'll be stagflationary. I don't think we're going to have a super hot economy. Uh I just think that the structural inflationary forces that have been in play and have been offset by broad slowing and cyclical uh, pressures will now have cyclical stimulus. Right. They've got a little injection, too. Exactly. What's going in the market, what's going in the market also should be showing up in some of this other stuff. I'll leave you with one last important thing. You know, if we do get this end of year rally, right, and we kick into uh, January 13th, 15th, Jan OPEX, uh, and and this thing is uh, 6,000 or higher, which is kind of, by the way, roadmap all year, right? We've been spot on. We got the wobble. Here comes the end of year rally. If we get to 6,000, 6,100, this thing starts blowing off. Be very careful in January. I think this market is setting up for a major uh, problem. This is a voting machine action. We're going to get some, you know, the end of the rally can often be the strongest, um, mm. but, but be very careful. I think this is a market up, vol up event. You want to be long, long dated calls. Later on. Later on. March, yeah. June of next year. You want to okay. be long those calls. You want to be playing this with leverage. It will be volatile. We will get pullbacks along the way, but this market, I believe, is going higher into January. All right. Jeb Carson, fun catch up. Always good. All right. Thanks.